We're indebted to Brother Willie Franklin for the marvelous job he's done in leading our singing. He's going to be speaking tomorrow, so you sure want to hear him speak. If he's half as good a preacher as he is a song leader, well, we're in for a great treat indeed. We're so happy to have Brother Rick Brumbach with us. Uh, perhaps you've never met Rick, but uh, you need to get acquainted with him because he's a marvelous gentleman and Christian uh, in every sense of the word. I met him up in uh, Denver, Colorado at the uh, lectureship of the Bear Valley School of Preaching. And he and I were on an open forum together and I heard him speak and I thought to myself, I've got to get him to come to Brown Trail for the lectureship here because he's a very learned individual, he's knowledgeable in God's word, and he's a very excellent speaker. So I'm sure that you're going to enjoy tremendously uh, getting to hear Rick. Another reason that I invited him is he's the director of the Southwest uh, School of Preaching in Austin, Texas. And we have such a great uh, director of the Brown Trail School that I wanted uh, those directors to get better acquainted and I also invited uh, Brother Gary Hampton, who's the director of the East Tennessee School of Preaching. So a marvelous relationship is going to result from these brethren getting to know each other better and working together for the building up of the kingdom. Rick is uh, the preacher also for the Southwest Congregation in Austin. And he is just finishing up his uh, PhD degree from Baylor University and uh, he's well educated and just such a wonderful man. He and his wife, Lee, have three children, ages 14, 12, and seven. And he's going to be talking to us on the great subject of Jesus, the sin sacrifice. And I know you're going to enjoy hearing him, Brother Rick Brumbach. It is my pleasure to be here with the Brethren of Brown Trail. I appreciate from Brother Boren and the congregation, the eldership here, the invitation to come. I appreciate that because I am also going to be here through the week and I get to hear great preaching, great singing, and to worship with my brethren. That is privileged and I appreciate that. From time to time as we meet people in you know, ad hoc situations, we mingle, we make small talk. People will sometimes ask me, as I do of them, what is it that you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm a gospel preacher. Oh. And that's about the end of that conversation. <laughs> I might as well have just said, well, I'm an axe murderer. Oh, got to go. <laughs> but I am grateful for the opportunity to talk to people about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm grateful that people hear a message that makes a difference in their lives. And I wouldn't change that for anything. Which is also why I am privileged to be here this week, to be able to reflect upon the great truths of God's Word. And I think tonight we are certainly considering one of the most pivotal topics, that of Jesus, the sacrifice for our sins. Master Teacher, John chapter 3. A moral exemplar, John 8. A guide to heaven, John chapter 14. It is true that the pages of the scripture present Jesus in all of these guises. They're all important. But if that were all we knew and all he did, it would not be enough to help you and me follow him to heaven. If Jesus were not also the sacrifice for our sins, then he could not complete the heavenly plan for the redemption in prospect of all people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a topic that is of paramount importance because there are those voices that, in some fashion, acknowledge Jesus as a teacher or as a moral figure, while at the same time denying, diminishing, or even denouncing his role at the cross. Would it surprise you to know that within Islam, for example, Jesus is regarded as a tremendous prophet, subordinate only to Muhammad? Muslims, in fact, have a very well-developed Christology or religious philosophy about Christ. But in no sense does it include any recognition of his work as a sacrifice for sins. The reason is because they claim that their God, Allah, 
needs no atonement for sins to be pleased. Instead, they believe that Allah simply forgives and that the Bible that you hold is in error any time it makes reference to Jesus going to Calvary. It is just as they make a mistake in equating Allah with Jehovah, that's mistaken, but they're also mistaken when they claim that Jesus did not die on that Friday for humanity. Even secular historians acknowledge that he died on that occasion, and we know the reason why. While Islam may talk about Christ, they propose a revisionist history that is bankrupt. And then there are those who might look at the cross and acknowledge its historicity, that it did in fact occur, but they diminish the significance of it because they say that Jesus came and in fact was rejected by his Jewish countrymen rather than being received as God expected. And as a consequence, the cross and the church are another attempt to salvage this situation in which God was surprised by the human response. Finally, I should mention, there are those theologians who make the most egregious error, I suppose, of all. They look at the cross and they say that it is an instance of divine child abuse by God. When they speak about that, they betray the fact that they do not know anything about justice as it relates to Jehovah. They fail to recognize that it was an adult Jesus who went to the cross and said that he gave his life for his sheep and for his friends, John 10, 17 and 18. As we survey these thoughts, I am reminded of the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, where he says to them that are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But that is exactly why we need to make certain that we understand the topic, the service done by Jesus Christ, and the influence that it's supposed to have not just for everyone else out in the world, but ladies and gentlemen, the significance that it is meant to have in your life and in mine. When we arrive home in the evenings and snap on the television, or perhaps we turn on the radio as we listen in our automobiles, perhaps we catch a glimpse of newspaper headlines, we find ourselves at times assaulted mentally, emotionally, <coughs> and even spiritually, by the accounts of error and sin and evil that pervade those reports. We read about nations going to war against nations, or genocide, which threatens the existence of an entire population. Or we hear about the grisly violence of one individual against another, and the abuses of innocent people. But then there are those things that we know of that don't make the headlines, and yet nevertheless occur far too frequently. How about occasions where there is strife in a family, or turmoil inside of a neighborhood, or even difficulties inside of the Lord's church? I realize that people can do great things, and that people often make very fine choices that they ought to repeat over and over again. But it takes just a few moments observation of current events to remind us that humanity has a sin problem. And far too often the human race is guilty of, as Paul would say, walking according to the course of this world, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Along the way, human beings sometimes believe that they can propose a solution to these problems Sadly, the, pro the proposals lead us further away from God instead of closer to Him. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was trumpeted often that the world was going through a period of moral advancement and development. That people were getting better, their behavior improving, they were becoming more morally developed. In this golden age, in short, people are being good. And then with the advent of World War I, this naive assumption was shattered because the world suddenly became aware of civilized man's inhumanity. In our own time period, maybe the late 20th and early now 21st centuries, we live in a period that is sometimes called the postmodern age, 
One of the signature elements of this period of time is that there is a rejection of any claims of absolute truth. Now, postmoderns will say that human beings have a spiritual side, a, a metaphysical element to them. But then what? Well, they will say that you do that which seems right to you, I'll do that which seems right to me. There is no overarching truth in this uh, claim. Instead, there is this faith community that does what it wants to do, this faith community does what it wishes, and this group what it wishes, and so on. What we're told is that if we look inside of ourselves, there will arise from inside the human being the answers that we need for good, successful living, as if there is a beacon of light that will guide us through life. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the end of the first decade of the 21st century. You would have a very hard time convincing me that people have grown better or that they have found solutions thus far arising from within. The fact is we need God and we need the service that he offers as he blesses us, especially through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're talking tonight about the word sin. And I suppose that that is an unlikely and probably unwelcome word in most people's vocabulary. Outsiders probably think it's only preachers that use that word. They might even think it's an occupational hazard. The fact is that God and his people have always talked about the matters of right and wrong. The discussion of sin as a topic has been and will continue to be important because it lies at the very heart of our existence as God's creatures. The writers of the New Testament used a very curious word to speak of sin. It is the Greek word hamartia. Now, it isn't just a New Testament word. Writers from that time period used it, and it had the general sense of missing the mark. Envision for a moment... The archer puts the arrow to the bowstring and begins to pull back until the fletching is at the corner of the cheek. Closing one eye and siding along the shaft, the archer releases and the arrow leaps from the bow. It traces its trajectory towards its target and completely misses the bullseye. That is hamartia. Now, by inspiration, the writers of the New Testament took that concept and began to apply it to topics of a moral and spiritual nature. Now we're talking about people who miss the standard or the expectation spiritually and in their choices, decision-making. But for me to say that makes an assumption that there's a standard, that God has a bullseye. Only from a being that stands outside of our human sphere could there come a standard that is pertinent and appropriate for all people concerning their behavior, their thoughts, their deeds, and to which all people could be accountable. It would have to have a divine origin, which means it would have to come from the revelation of God. That is why the writer in Psalm 119, verse 33, speaks toward God and he says, Order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. It is that same discussion of personal responsibility that was at the heart of the question asked of Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 35. I wouldn't be surprised if many in this audience, perhaps even our children, could recite or say the answer Jesus gave to that question. He said, the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And then he continued a step further and said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. I wonder if a person standing in the crowd that day heard that answer and might have thought to themselves, I wonder what love or devotion like that would look like. It would look like all of God's revelation in the patriarchal era, in the mosaical age, and even in the Christian period, as God indicated in those places and times exactly what he would like for people to do. That's why Jesus concluded that discussion, and he said, on these, hang both the, or on these two hang the law and the prophets. You see, that's at the root of showing our love and devotion to God. You know as well as I do 
The problem is that we miss the mark. And every time that you say the words, I'm sorry, you ratify that fact. There are two things that we should be convinced of with regard to human beings, with regard to ourselves. Two things that the Word of God says about human existence, and they are this. Number one, that it is only possible to know righteousness through God's divine revelation. And number two, that human beings can do nothing to remove the guilt from their own sins of themselves alone. Now with regard to the former, I recall the very famous, well-known words of Jeremiah, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. But it's also said positively. For example, by the words of the writer, again, Psalm 119, this time verses 98 through 100. Thou through, my, through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I keep thy precepts. It would be unfair of me to admit, if I did not admit that people do have a sense sometimes of right and wrong, what would be good and what wouldn't be good. But we should not be deluded. We should recognize that only from God can come a comprehensive and accurate knowledge of Him and of what it means for us to live worthy of our divine origin. That type of guidance could only come from one who is himself perfect, untainted by the sins of this world, and yet who speaks to it, to us, in an attempt to guide us because he loves us. We ought to think of God's revelation as a demonstration of his graciousness, his compassion, and his mercy as he knows us and our limitations. It is wrong for us to think that we can chart our own lives you and I need God's Word. The second thing, what can we do about our sins and the times we've said our so I'm sorry on our own? Again, we go to the words of Jeremiah who spoke to his own generation, words that are just as true today. In Jeremiah 2.22, he spoke and he said, You may wash thee with lye, take thee much soap, yet is thine iniquity marked before me, says the Lord God. There is nothing that you and I can do in creating a list of good deeds or perhaps crafting some cleansing ritual that will remove from us the guilt that arises from our wrongdoing. Nothing. And even those who don't believe in God acknowledge some truth to that statement. Imagine for a moment there's a hardened criminal. And it is proposed if you will just draw up a list of good deeds that you would be willing to do why, we will let you go and act as if you'd never done anything wrong at all. Can you imagine the uproar that would come if a judge proposed that at a sentencing hearing? Even if someone does satisfy those things that are said to be their debt or obligation to society, the criminal still has to acknowledge that they bear the guilt of that or the status of that for the rest of their lives. Every time they fill out a job application, they have to say what? I sinned. I committed a felony. Every time they apply for school, I sinned. Yes, I paid my debt, but I'm not really forgiven and my sin washed away. Only in Jesus Christ can that type of renewal and start be achieved. I wouldn't say that there's no means of escape. It simply does not arise from human action, human wisdom. It is the result of divine action and divine wisdom. That's at the center of what we know as the golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 and 17. God has a plan, and it centers upon that salvific or saving act of Jesus at the cross 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is a plan to take us from a state of guilt all the way to a state of innocence so that our sins are remembered no more. We are allowed to rise above them and to have a fresh start. That is why Paul spoke of that at the close of Romans chapter 3. In verse 26, he said that in this action, God is both just and the justifier. Just in the sense that he has to uphold righteousness, integrity, fairness, all of the standards of goodness that characterize his very existence. But at the same time, he has manufactured a means or a way by which you, by which I, can be forgiven and declared innocent one more time. So while there are those voices who would like to expunge the cross from history, here is God establishing it there fully, and he even does so before the event itself occurs. Golgotha was pronounced by Isaiah in the 53rd chapter of his book. There, speaking of Jesus, he said he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Why? Because all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and God hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. His life lived perfectly, for our lives lived perfectly imperfectly. By his stripes and by his death, we are healed. That is at the center of what Jesus said to Zacchaeus in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I am so grateful. The historicity of the cross should not be doubted. It occurred as it was intended. In fact, along with its historical reality, you and I should be convinced that God anticipated the cross. It was not a secondary plan. Even to have the words of Isaiah we just commented about demands that God would have seen centuries and centuries prior the sacrifice there on that hillside. There are other spokesmen in the Old Testament who also foreshadowed, advanced the knowledge of the cross, how about Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, where we're told the price that would be given to Judas in order to betray Jesus. We're also told that those 30 pieces of silver would be used, cast to the potter. They were used to buy potter's field. Zechariah saw it coming. He may not have understood everything. In fact, likely not. But God did, and through inspiration, said something about the cross. When Jesus was on earth conducting his ministry, as time passed, he would open up before the people that followed him, his disciples, his apostles, an awareness of what he was facing at the end of his life. We might remember Matthew chapter 16 with Peter's great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But how many of us are familiar with the words just after that episode in which it tells us Jesus informed them that they would be going to Jerusalem, that there at the hands of the chief priests and elders he would die. You know, Peter goes along and says, Lord, be it far from thee, and Jesus responds, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because there would be no interfering with Jesus' date with that destiny. And in the ensuing chapters of the gospel accounts, we see Jesus giving more and more information about his demise as it approached. It would be many years later that his apostle John, the beloved, his good friend, would write of Jesus in Revelation 13, verse 8, and say that he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before Adam and Eve ever did anything wrong, 
God already had Golgotha in his plans. When we read about the book of Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, the writer there says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Think about those words for just a moment. Though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That is a reference to the events leading up to and culminating in the execution of of Jesus. The text continues in Hebrews 5 to say, and having been made perfect. Now that doesn't mean sinless. Jesus was sinless. But it means that he became the perfect satisfaction to atone for the sins of humanity. Having been made perfect, he became the author, that is the one who brings into existence for the very first time, he is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. God intended Jesus to go there. Jesus knew it, and he went willingly. It wasn't abusive. It was a willing sacrifice of self. I live in Austin, and on the University of Texas campus, on the main building and the facade, there are carved the words, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We probably know where they picked those words. I've often wondered, they mean so much differently than what Jesus meant when he spoke those words. I've wondered if God isn't tempted to come down, claim copyright infringement, and make them take it down. It comes from a passage in John 8, verses 31 and 32, which says this, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, in that context, those who heard him on that day said, we are not the slaves of any person to be granted freedom. To which Jesus responded and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a slave to sin. Verse 34. Just like me, you have in your life those occasions of regret. You have those dark spots when you wish you could go back and redo something. You may wish that you could turn the clock's hands backwards and have another chance, but we cannot. However, we need to address the things that we have done and be honest with our real situation. A part of the challenge of preaching the gospel is to awaken women and men to their real spiritual condition. To his young friend Timothy, Paul would write, 2 Timothy 2, 26, that a part of the servant of the Lord's task is to assist those individuals that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have been taken captive by him at his will. Yes, Jesus gave his life, but for it to become effective in the life of any individual, that person has to respond appropriately to what Christ has done. That person has to acknowledge that they too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is nothing that humanity can do to nullify the work of Christ. Nothing. But every time an individual overlooks, neglects, or denies that work, they have denied themselves the gift that Jesus would bequeath to them through his blood. I suppose one of the best statements that I could find in the Bible to speak about this service rendered by Christ comes from the pen of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. There the text says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Now if we put in the necessary clarifications from the context, it says this, For he, God hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we... Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's you, that is I, that is all people, that we might be both the recipients of and the practitioners of the right God in Christ. We are blessed by his acceptance and fulfillment 
of the, the divine plan for redemption. Jesus would go on in his life to say that it is the giving of our lives in response that he seeks. In Mark 8 and verse 35, he says that we need to give our lives in response for him and for the gospel. Would you be willing to lay down your life for Christ the way he laid down his for you? Paul said it so famously in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself for me. Were the cross not actuality, in actuality, an event God planned and executed, those words could not be spoken. So while there are those voices who would like to challenge our understanding and the Bible statements about the cross, I remind us of these certain facts. It is true that Jesus came and he was an extraordinary teacher. It is also true that Jesus was and is the perfect moral example. He lived piously. In fact, of him, in Acts 10 and verse 38, as Peter preached to Cornelius, he spoke of Jesus. And he said he went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I hope that all of us can say that we are with God because we walk after righteousness. It is true that he was the moral example. It is also true that Jesus was and is the guide to heaven, John 14. But here's the thing, if he were not also the one who could set us free from sin, none of us could follow him there. And so he said in Matthew 20 and verse 28, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our responsibility is to respond in love and gratitude to appreciate what the cross means in our lives and in all of human history, it stands unsurpassed as the crucial event in the life of the human race, and we ought to see it so. Paul would write, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Here it is, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, whether of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The scriptures tell us sin matters. It cannot be ignored. The passing of time does not make it disappear. It cannot be wished away. Instead, it has to be addressed through the only avenue possible, the saving blood of Jesus Christ. I know there are good deeds in your past. But I also ask you if you have addressed the ones that are not so good. Have you also addressed the things where evil and temptation won the day? The blood of Jesus was shed specifically so that we may put those behind us and stand clean, anew, refreshed, and invigorated before our God and ultimately before our judge. Have you been cleansed by the blood of Christ from your past deeds? And if not, then I ask you that before this evening is out, that you take a long look and think about your past, the need to cope with those, and the truthfulness behind Jesus' service and the proclamation of it. Tonight, wouldn't you be willing to leave those sins behind to gain your freedom? And along the way, all you have to do is acknowledge Jesus as the Son, the very Savior of Calvary. If you would be willing to change your ways, 
embrace the good, reject the bad in repentance, then you are prepared to be baptized into Christ where you touch the shed blood and you find your forgiveness. I'm sure you will concur with me that